Bethany, welcome to the show. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you for having me. Let's start right at the kind of at the the foundation of this. How old were you when you started gymnastics? Um, I was five years old when I started gymnastics. Yeah, so okay. pretty young. Um, yeah, like gymnastics seems to have this incredible physical ability to prime good movement quality, but it has such a mixed review in terms of the mentality you come out with. Um, what yeah. are your memories of gymnastics like? Um, I just remember being there all the time. Um, we were pretty highly competitive at a really young age. So I started competing like at six or seven um, and then started going to school there. So I was there from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. pretty much every day. So we would do like kind of like CrossFit. We have uh, two sessions that we do. So that's why I think CrossFit was like a perfect uh, combo for me. But we would have a session from 7 to 10.30 in the morning that was based on conditioning. And then we would go to school from 10.30 to 3. And then gymnastics again from 3.30 to 7, which was more about the events and hitting each, like the bars, the vault, the floor, and the beams. So, yeah, that's, it was, it was a lot. I had fun. Ins- I had a lot of fun. Yeah, it sounds fun, but it also sounds like super intense in terms of a lot yeah. and like very dedicated towards gymnastics. Was that like some sort of uh, specialist school then? then? Yeah, it was, it was just called charter school. So basically um, we had hired on teachers, but it was just like two or three of us per grade and there wasn't a ton of us. And um, yeah, we were just stuck at the gym all day. <laughs> I mean, sweet. it's kind of weird to think about now because like there was no windows or anything. So we were just kind of like stuck upstairs and like not an attic, but it was like the second floor, but it felt like an attic because there's no windows. So <laughs> I like think about it now and I'm like, hmm, a little weird, but yeah. And then it was like yeah. 36 hours a week. So it was, it was a lot of training. It was a lot of training, but, um, it definitely made you grow up really quickly. Very fast. Say. Um, you just had to be independent. You had to be able to do things on your own and not necessarily rely on, uh, another adult to do things for you. I mean, we obviously had each other as athletes, um, but we're all little kids and we're all just trying to figure out life as it goes and, uh, the struggles that come with it. And, aches and pains and getting injured and um just life in itself and just emotions and you just have to kind of just wing it and figure it out but I feel like that's you know most kids but you don't really have your your parents to rely on when you're gone from 7 a.m to 7 p.m every day yeah so you did that from five years old to how long um well so I started going to school there like when I was seven um and then in and out but basically I did it until I was 13 or 14 and then injured my back really bad so um unfortunately I had to quit I feel like that's what kind of happens with gymnasts either you get burnt out um because of all the hours that we're doing or there's an injury that just takes you out to the point where doctors are like yeah you're 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 done so that was unfortunately uh, my story yeah how did you injure your back Um, It was just a tumbling incident. And I think gymnastics mentality is when you do get hurt, you just kind of push through it. Mm -hmm. And um, it's a, it's a people pleasing thing. I think it happens a lot. And I mean, it happens in men too, but especially little girls looking up to Mm -hmm. their, their coaches, their males, they want to please them. So um, you just kind of push through things and that's kind of what happened. I felt it. And um, during the tumbling incident and I was like, ah, I'm okay. And like, you're more, like flexible back then and your your bones are kind of you know you can kind of work through things a little bit easier than you can now now I'm like oh something hurts I'm gonna stop but back then it's just like oh you're, I'm fine it's fine everything's fine and uh yeah. then and then it got to the point where it wasn't fine and I couldn't move at 12 years old so um yeah it was it was a pretty rough injury unfortunately I definitely want to come back to the kind of the people pleasing coaching because it's something that we oh, work yeah. with athletes on the whole time. It's like it's super yeah. common, and especially in that female to male relationship, it's something you see like yes. really, really commonly. Um, but mm-hmm. let's talk about that injury just a little bit more. How does that affect you yeah. when you're like early teens, twelve years old? Ah, oh, yeah, it was. Um, I mean, it still affects me now, unfortunately. Um, I think a lot of it is connected to emotions, though. That's kind of what I've realized through just a lot of deep diving and um, just working on some personal growth because it's literally nothing crazy. Like, it's a very common injury of just bulging discs in my L4 and L5. Like, nothing ever was fractured, nothing. But 
but there was a lot going on at that time in my life. And I think that's just where I hold my stress. I think some people hold their stress in their neck and their shoulders, sometimes in their knees, if they have bad knees. Um, but my stress was more connected to my back. And at that time or around that time when that stuff was happening, my parents were actually going through a divorce. So it just kind of magnified a lot of things. And I was like, okay, I can't really control a lot of what's going on. I can't do gymnastics. So I can't really work out. My parents are going through a divorce. What can I control? And so it became uh, an eating disorder. And so I think all of that is just like connected and intertwined into my back. And so I have to be really, really mindful now in my late twenties, almost 30 dealing with all the repercussions that I did go through in my teenage years with the back and eating disorders and trying to control things and, and all of that. It's, it's very, it's very crazy. Like once you start going into depth of what's really going on sometimes with our bodies and how connected our bodies are with our minds, like it's really mind blowing. It's really yeah. mind blowing. So especially, especially when day. you're, when you're a kid and you're going through that as well, it's kind mm -hmm. of, it's your world and you don't really know any different. But then when you get yeah, a bit yeah. of a bit of age and a bit of perspective on it, you look back and it's like, actually, that was a lot of shit to deal with. Like um, yeah. everything yeah. that came together there was like the perfect storm, which would create like kind of your body saying, hey, I need some attention and kind of would feed yeah. into um, eating disorders and things like that. So it's like, mm -hmm. it's hardly surprising. But that must have been super tough. Yeah, I think it's honestly really common, though. I think a lot of mm. women and, and men deal with that, too. Um, it's just something I think eating disorders are something that uh, deal with control and it's a control issue and like, OK, we can't really control anything else that's going on in our lives. Let's control food intake, you know. And so, yeah, I, I mean, like when I had to quit gymnastics, my back, my back was to the point where. I, I literally like couldn't move. And um, so doctors were like, and you know, you have to take everything with a grain of salt with what doctors say, but they're just like, you're never gonna run again. You're never gonna tumble again. You're never gonna do gymnastics. And um, as like a, a 12, 13 year old, like that's, and gymnastics was my entire life at that point. Like I felt like everything was out of control. And so I felt like at a loss, like I was just like, I, I don't even know what to do with myself, you know? And, uh, it was, it was really hard. And so I was like, well, I can't work out, not going to eat. You know, I was like, I don't want to look like, like I saw a lot of my friends that quit gymnastics. Cause we go from like 36 hours a week to basically zero probably. And we're not growing any taller. Uh, so a lot of people just got fat and I looked at them and I was like, I don't want that to be me. I don't want to get fat. And like, that was the only thing that would replay in my head for some reason. I was like, I don't want to be fat. I don't want to be fat. And so I was like, well, I can control not eating. So I guess I'm just going to do that since I can't work out. So that was just kind of like my mindset at a teenage year, adolescent brain. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's, it's interesting how that kind of, how that drive for aesthetics it comes from like a really young age it's programmed into us societally yeah. and also i think biologically there's this need to mm -hmm. fit in and also to kind of look a certain way like I, i've no idea what it's like growing up as a teenage girl um but it <laughs> seems like there's that added pressure that comes in a little bit earlier yeah yeah for sure and uh i mean hormones definitely don't help and like you know going through puberty doesn't help and all of that and yeah it's just it's a wild time but I mean like I always say like men go through their own problems and issues too and, and puberty too so they have hormonal changes and things they're thinking about and things they expect for their bodies to do or not do and sometimes it doesn't happen you know yeah so you obviously it's a that's a scenario that if you're going to choose you'd say okay i'd rather not go through that i'd rather not experience eating disorders i'd rather not have like kind of my um identity hung on gymnastics but like there's there's benefits and there's there's things that you can like take from it there's lessons that you can take from it what have you learned from that yeah i mean honestly like i don't necessarily regret having to go through all of that because i don't think i would be going through all this personal growth that i've gone through the last couple of years to kind of get me to this point so honestly i have a lot of gratitude for it and thankful for it it's hard it was hard yeah it was hard but it's a part of my story and honestly i can stand on the other side of it and be like this is a part of my story and, and if anything it helps other people so 
that's why like it's important to use my platform and use my voice um through podcasts and any other interviews that I can get is to be open and honest with this stuff because a lot of people go through it, you know, to certain extents, like everyone's got their levels of, you know, wanting to control things or body image issues or, or whatever it is. So I think the more that we share, it's, it's important to be able to do that because we can all come together and um, yeah, share stories with each other to be able to grow. Those are the words of someone who's done the work, like really impressive. It's, it's not like you don't Going luckily, the work. <laughs> yeah, but you, you don't luckily get to that point. Like you don't just kind of, you don't yeah. have kind of negative experiences happen to you and then just come out yeah. of it with a better mentality. Like it requires conscious effort. When did you, yeah. like how long after those situations or how old are you when you started thinking about it in a, in a way that expressed gratitude? 2019. Not that long ago, not that long ago. Yeah, what was the switch? I dug myself a deep hole. Um, there is a, a couple different combos of things. I think it's always like, it's never really one situation. It's always like a combination of things. But uh, 2019 at the CrossFit Games, I ended up getting eighth that year. And that's been my best place, my finish. Um, and I came out of it and I was like, not happy felt really undeserving, felt like I wasn't good enough for that position. Um, and just all these negative thoughts and didn't really feel like I had anybody to share it with. And yeah, I like pushed a lot of people away. I dug myself a, a very deep hole emotionally and physically. Um, and uh, I, I, through the grace of God, got eighth place because I was not having a good year that year. <laughs> like, it was not a good year. Um, but CrossFit's been always like my saving grace since I started it. Um, it's always been something that I can focus on and, and do. Um, so I'm super thankful for that. But yeah, 2019 got done with the CrossFit Games and just realized that like eighth place is an amazing accomplishment, you know, and a lot of people would love to have that accomplishment. And to not even feel happy or deserving of that and be able to share that with others, I was like, okay, then what's, what's going to be enough, you know? And I think I just realized in that moment, and as I started to dive a little bit deeper that like, none of that stuff matters. Like winning doesn't matter. Placement doesn't matter. Money doesn't matter. Like that stuff is never going to satisfy. There's never going to be like a full cup of fulfillment through that stuff. So I think I was just like, okay, then like, what, what is like, what is going to give me that fulfillment? And I think, um, realizing that I pushed a lot of people away and that you need, you need community. Like you need people, even if it's like a, a small circle of people, like you need to have that to be able to find, uh, um, like true fulfillment. Um, and, uh, not necessarily joy in people but like it, it like I said it just it takes the full community and like deep diving into like character and all of that that is really going to find your fulfillment and your cup being full at all times that way like when when this, this stuff does happen um because I do want a podium like I want to get on the podium like you're allowed to have goals like I think it's okay to have goals and want to accomplish things um but like, or it, and if that never happens or it does happen, like it's not going to waver who I am and like how I feel about myself. I think that's the biggest thing. And um, yeah, just felt very unfulfilled by that. That's for sure. Very unfulfilled. What's interesting there is you mentioned how community and being part of something and being supported and supporting others is so important. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, when you we're talking about gymnastics you talked about how you had to like learn to look after yourself and you had to learn that independence yeah. and like yeah you yeah. had a community around mm -hmm. you but it's like okay you're a young kid like switch on and and look after yourself in this environment so it's juxtaposed yeah. yeah yeah no I and I thought that's just how you did life I was like well I'm just gonna have to figure it out on my own and that's how I I started CrossFit in 2017 I was like I'm just gonna have to figure this out on my own you know and it's just and it's in it so it's funny because I actually kind of had an epiphany yesterday actually about this of it, it is an individual sport CrossFit is so like it's it is you against you and you have you have to put in the work you have to do this stuff but that doesn't mean that you can't have other people surrounding you to um to lean on and support and um to be vulnerable with and 
that doesn't mean that they're taking your arms and making you do the lifts and, you know, clean and whatever, but like you, you have to feel like there, there's gotta be support and you can't feel like the burden of the world is on your shoulders. And I think that's kind of how I felt for a long time is like, I got this, I'm on my own. I don't need anybody. And it gets heavy. It gets really heavy when you're trying to do that by yourself. So yes, you're out there on the floor by yourself. And yes, every day when you're training, it's you, but like you have to have others too to, that are going to lift you up and like carry your burdens with you. And it doesn't mean you're throwing your burdens on other people. You, you still have to figure out your burdens, but you can still offload some of your burdens and have someone carry it with you. Yeah. The way I describe that to our athletes is it's like an arch. Like if you had like a, if you had like two people and one person's mm -hmm. leaning fully on the other person, it would crumble. But if you had like all these yeah. people leaning together, it makes like a really strong structure and it, it gives yeah. you something like bigger to grow from. So it's, mm -hmm. it is a kind of, you have to give up something as well. You have to give up some control over the situation. You have to give up yes. some kind of <laughs> some arrogance of thinking like, Hey, I can do it all. And it's like, I've been there. Yeah. Like my ego, ego gets involved. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Right. Um, and you mentioned something really interesting there as well. It's like, you need people to be vulnerable with. What do you mean by that? Yeah. Um, I think so. I think personally for me, I have an inner circle of three people, four people that I, they know everything about me. They know literally everything about me. And I think when you're vulnerable with those people that you trust, they can insert truth when you need it. And truth sometimes hurts. <laughs> and you're like, oh, yeah. but sometimes you need to hear it because sometimes we have entitlement issues and think that we're right. And there's ego, ego's the enemy. Um, and so they just kind of steer you in the right direction. And, but you can't get to that place unless you're vulnerable with that person you know, and really trust that person and trust that they have your best interests in heart. So, and it takes time to build that. You can't just build that overnight. Um, but I think once you do, and once you have that, it's, it's everything. Like you learn, you can learn so much from your community and like just ways of thinking that maybe you're just not thinking, you know, like you have this one thought, sometimes it's very narrow-minded of, and it, it's not, necessarily on purpose you're not trying to be egotistical necessarily but you know we're humans and we're sinful and uh we think certain ways and feel like we should be right all the time but sometimes that's just not the case and so they definitely uh steer you in the right direction sometimes when you get it when you get off path so that truth yeah. is so hard to uncover yourself when you kind of when yeah. you're kind of picking away at it and you can do all the journaling you want you can like kind of do all the work on yourself you can do all the meditation yeah. you want to kind of to focus on your own narratives but it's hard to do by yourself without a kind of an outside force reflecting it back at you yeah. when's been a and you can skip this question if you want when's <laughs> been a time when that truth has really kind of not been what one part of you wanted to hear but what you needed here um I guess I'll share what happened yesterday <laughs> uh I don't know if we'll have to edit this out but I'll I'll, uh, I'll say it anyways um so so a big indicator for me with my back is when my back starts hurting or it spasms or I have a problem with it it's showing me it's an indicator that I'm trying to control something, something in the world I'm trying to control, whether it's something in the gym, something outside of the gym, personal, whatever. And I actually had my back spasm yesterday. It wasn't bad, but it was to the point where I was like, all right, guess I'm not going to work out today. It's, it's not worth it. Like if I keep going, it's going to go out fully and uh, I have the open to do. I can do it on Monday if I need to, but that's the last, that's the last moment I get, like I have to do it. So it's about being smart at this point. Um, and so in the past for me, when my back spasms, um, I go into the victim mindset of why me, why is this happening? And I get into a really dark place. I get, it's just really easy to, just because of, I think I have flashbacks of being 12 and just feeling like I'm out of control. Like, why is this happening to me? I feel like I'm doing everything right. It's, you know, bad things happen. 
bad things happen to good people. Mm -hmm. Good things happen to bad people. It's just the way life is. Um, and so yesterday that happened. And luckily I've gotten to the point where I've done so much self-growth. I have a great community behind me that I can get truth in front of me really quickly and kind of bounce back from this in a matter of hours instead of a matter of weeks and sometimes months, like two years ago, it took me eight weeks to get, get out of a slump one time. It was bad. It was awful. And, and the, the more I stay in the slump, the more my back hurts and it'll spasm again and it'll get tighter and tighter and tighter. And, uh, I just don't want that to happen anymore. I don't want that to be a part of my story and, uh, realizing that it's just bulging discs, that it, it's gotta be more than just working out too hard or whatever. It's emotional. Right. And so yesterday I got on the phone with all my people. Somehow I managed to get on the phone with four people yesterday that are my close niche community and got different perspectives from everyone. Some, some are empaths. So they're more just emotionally in tune of like, so sorry that that happened. And it's like, yeah, I need to hear that. Like you, you need to hear sometimes like someone's sorry for you, like it's okay. Um, and I have another friend that kind of speaks a little bit more truth and is very in tuned emotionally with things. And so when I was talking to her about what's kind of going on, um, she was like, Bethany, this is literally a control problem. You're literally trying to control something that you are never meant to control. And I was just like, ah, you're right. You're right. And I'm not going to go into details about exactly what it was, but, um, yeah, I just, I realized that I was trying to control something, um, in the gym, in the gym, I'll give you those details that is not meant for me to control. And it's now trying to navigate how to let that go and let it be. And, uh, I, I don't know exactly what that looks like, but I think where, awareness is the most important thing. You're not, you can't change something unless you're aware of something. And so for me yesterday, I was able to pinpoint what the issue was. And now I've brought some light to it and some awareness to it. And now it's like, for me personally, I'm religious. So it's, it's giving it over to God. You know, I think, I think we try to control things that aren't meant for us to ever control and uh we we have a way of how we want life to be and like i think god gives us visions or or things that he wants us to accomplish in life um or like i guess like ideas and we can turn that into something bad by the way that we want it to go if that makes sense so it's like we're married to an idea of like how life's supposed to go or how how you're supposed to accomplish this goal that God's given you. And uh, I think that's what I was trying to do is like, okay, X, Y, Z. And it's just not, sometimes it's messy. It's messy, mm. super messy. And uh, I think just taking your hands off for a second and not trying to be a backseat driver and allowing God for like, personally for me, allowing God to just <laughs> control it instead of me and just letting him do his work um, was important for me to realize that. And it's like, you know, that I know that, but sometimes like friends bring that truth to you. So, um, I had like a great epiphany yesterday, was able to kind of get to the point really quickly instead of this lingering, what was me thing and shutting down and staying in my dark cave for weeks or days on end. Um, and allow myself to still have a moment of crying and victimization. Cause I think that's okay. Um, but not allowing it to linger because that's where, like, if I let, I let it linger, especially now at this time in the season, like it's not going to be good, you know? So anyways, that's a long, well, sorry, it was long winded, but oh, that's great. Like, <laughs> there's a lot, there's a lot. <laughs> thank you so much for sharing that. Like, firstly, you've got some yeah. great friends around you. Like you've done a really good oh, job yeah. getting them I've around got, you. Yeah. Secondly, like yes. hearing you go through the work as well, being like, okay, I was aware of my emotions. I was aware of my thoughts. Like I kind of, I knew I was in this scenario, but like yeah. still going for that reflective idea of like having that back to you is like, again, it's yeah. time somebody's done the work. It takes practice to get to that point. You're not born being able to manage your emotional yeah. states and your narratives that, easily yeah. 
um and then Hard. like that, it's like literally yeah. an everyday battle <laughs> of course it is yeah of course it is and like athletes are no exception to that in fact there's probably more intensity because of what you're doing to your body as well and the effect that has on your nervous system and therefore your thoughts like it's hard it's mm -hmm. it's really really hard and like that ability to i suppose the word here is faith especially bringing up religion like this there's, there's faith mm -hmm. that there's something deeper than you kind of at work here um i'm mm -hmm. i'm not religious um but i see the like there's so much value in saying hey there's something bigger than i am like there's something yeah. bigger than, yeah. than me personally at work here even if you're coming at it from a completely atheistic point of view of saying hey there's other yeah. people around yeah. and they've got their own opinions and there's an external environment but taking your hand off the tiller and just going hey this is going to take me wherever i go and there's only mm -hmm. so many things that you can control and your yeah. thoughts and your emotions are basically them. Um, so start yep. there. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I think it's easy to like put pressure on myself as an athlete, like you were saying, I think, um, you know, everyone, everyone's got their pressures and stuff, but uh, personally, you know, experience from being an athlete, it, it's easy to put all these crazy expectations and burdens on myself and especially when there's injuries in my back and stuff and just feeling like I'm inadequate and I'm not going to be ready. I'm not fit enough. Um, if I can't be consistent in the gym, then I'm not going to be able to accomplish the goals that I want to. And it's like, no, just realizing that like, it doesn't really matter. Like you need to do what you're asked to do. Yes. And I have things that I need to do every single day in the gym and outside of the gym, but like, sometimes it's just crazy things can happen. You know, you don't necessarily have to be the most talented when you go to the CrossFit games, like you have to just, there's so, so many variables when you go to the CrossFit games of, are you sleeping enough? Are you fueling enough? Is your body intaking the fuel correctly? Do the workouts line up to your strengths or your weaknesses? Do you have good judges? Do you have bad judges? Like there are so many things out of your control that you just kind of have to like, just trust that it's going to work out the way it's supposed to, you know, and uh, easier said than done. That's for sure. And you can definitely take that same thought process into anything else that you're doing. It doesn't have to be the CrossFit games or a competition, uh, work life. Uh, family life too but just realizing that like things can happen in a really mind-blowing way that we can't even like fathom and I think just having that type of faith sometimes is it's important to have you know but that doesn't mean that you're just like all right I'm just gonna let it just be like you still you have to do the work you still have to do the work every single time but sometimes things just are you're married to this idea and it's not like that at all. Like I said earlier, like you have this idea of like how you think it's going to go and I'm going to get this place placement on this workout and this is how it's going to happen. And it's like, <laughs> no, <laughs> I could be injured at the CrossFit games and it still happened for me. You know what I mean? Like you just never know what life is going to take you and what roller coaster yeah. you're going to go on. And I suppose those kind of scenarios are where that mentality that you've cultivated of, hey, this is this could be a good thing. Like I'm I'm grateful for this. It really yeah, gets yeah. tested, but it's where it's most valuable. Yeah, yeah. It's uh but it, it that's the thing. Like uh it definitely gets tested every day and like on certain days a little bit more than others. And and I'm at fault for kind of falling into those traps of feeling like it, maybe it won't work out and trying to go back to controlling things and stuff. But, um, we're not supposed to be perfect in life and no human is right. But I think it's just going back to highlighting awareness on those things and just kind of getting back in line to the path that you want to go on. Cause you're going to veer off. Sometimes it's going to happen. Like you're going to have accidents, uh, something's going to go wrong with your car. You know what I mean? Like, but you have to get back on that path that you know is the right one for you to take. Yeah. It's different for always, everybody. Yeah, you're exactly right. It's different for everyone. And there's like, there's always this balance of 
athletes and anyone who's doing anything really requires a, an amount of confidence like and you see mm-hmm. some people whose confidence is bordering on the arrogant side but it's still it's <laughs> serving to a point if you go too far obviously you don't do the work you like skip workouts you cherry pick like you don't do your mobility because you think you're too good you don't get a coach all this yeah. kind of stuff like if you go too far like that's that's what happens if you go like and then you need that balanced with the kind of the faith aspect of like, hey, it's going to be okay. Like, I'm grateful for what comes my way. I'm going to make the most the, yeah. the most of it. How do you balance that that middle ground of like, hey, I'm going to be confident and I'm going to like attack this and do as much as I can with the kind of the more accepting version? Um. Yeah. It's. It's, it's a hard one. Like I said, I think it's an everyday battle and you have to, you just have to choose to, to know that confidently inside you're doing the things that you're assigned to do. And I think, um, we have personal assignments daily, daily ones, whether it's something really simple, like holding a door open for somebody or, you know, giving somebody a compliment, taking a, piece of trash off the ground you know like I think there's just like little things that we're supposed to be obedient to and um and it's not in like a demonic way of like oh if you don't do this then something bad is gonna happen to you you know it's not like a superstitious thing at all but I think that intuitively we are led to do certain things and um our heart our heart posture knows a lot more than our head sometimes And it's kind of just being in tuned with your heart and what it's asking you to do. And I think that kind of is where the, the middle ground lies in the confidence lies of, okay, there's certain things that I'm personally assigned to do for the day and just building your confidence within that, if that makes sense. I don't know if that really answered the question, but, um, if you want to re or re-ask me the question you can. No, it's it's all good. Like when <laughs> when I'm talking about mindset, I break it down to three areas. The physical, so yeah. like what you're doing to regulate your nervous system essentially. Um the philosophical, yeah. which is very easy to like you said the phrase ego is the enemy, like that kind of extract from mm-hmm. stoicism. Like it's easy to put it into words because we're conceptualizing it. And then there's the spiritual yeah. aspect, which I always get pushed back on from the CrossFit community because we're kind of quite a <laughs> quite a kind of Oh, if you're not quantifiable, like you've got to push away from it. It's a bit different in the States because it's a kind of a different um, society around religion. But there's like, mm-hmm. it's a bit more nebulous and it's a bit more difficult to put into terms. But that ability to say like, hey, like my, like the phrase used was heart posture, right? Like my heart posture mm-hmm. like is just, is open. I'm going to see this as an opportunity to do some good. Like that's what we're talking about when it comes down to that spiritual aspect and that development of who you are not yeah. philosophically not psychologically but yeah. like something deeper than that character too yeah mm. uh, I always try to remind uh, myself personally but others around me too that no one's gonna really remember placements either in events or even at a competition like no one's gonna remember that stuff years from now months from now you know But what they are going to remember is like how you react and how you respond to those things, right? Like say I get last place in a workout, how are you going to react and respond? Are you going to have a pity party in front of the whole crowd and be pissed off and not go and congratulate someone that beat you? Or are you going to take the time and go congratulate someone that was, was better than you at that moment, you know? And, uh, I think people will always remember that stuff. So it's always been important for me to do that. Um, and to always have that posture. And, um, I feel like that carries way more weight than winning an event, winning a workout, you know, like who cares? Like no one's going to, no one cares about that stuff. No one, no one cares about that stuff. Yeah. So, because there's the, yeah, there's the reputation, there's a reputation in the community, but there's also the reputation yeah. with yourself. And one of those other people will forget, but you'll never forget who you were in those moments. And it can feed into like kind of this confidence and this really beautiful um, vulnerability and supporting, Mm -hmm. or it can feed into kind of bitterness and resentment. It's your choice how you act in those moments and it affects Mm -hmm. the ultimate outcome a lot more than we give it credit for. Yeah, yeah. My friend put it this way and 
it's, I think it's like kind of a cute little saying, but it's just like, act like a champion, like walk around like a champion, you know, like always be proud of like what you did, whether you win or get second or last place, like you should always try to be as consistent as possible. I think with like your personality and who you are, and it doesn't mean you're not allowed to get excited or whatever when things happen in life. But I think um, keeping more of like a neutral kind of mindset and just trying to be, trying to replicate that no matter what happens in the workout, right. Or in training too, like don't get overly excited and, and proud of yourself because that doesn't look very nice when you beat everybody, you know, and um, don't have a pity party when you lose. It's like finding that neutral balance. Yeah, so exactly. And that applies whether it's on the competition or whether it's in the fraction of a second within one movement where you've missed a snatch yeah. or you, you've hit it. Um, yeah. It applies with the whole career that you have. It applies, it applies to your relationships, your work, like mm -hmm. your family life, like whatever it is, like it's that kind of, okay, things didn't go as planned. How am I going to act in yeah. response to that? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Where did bodybuilding come into things? <laughs> um, I started bodybuilding when I was 18. So it was like 18 to 20. What well, didn't happen. It didn't last very long. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it was still a part of my, like, um, the only reason I decided to do bodybuilding is because I was going through a lot of body image issues and a lot of eating disorders. And I was like, Oh, this is a way for me to look really fit. Um, and not knowing really anything about it or diving into it. And then after doing it, even after my first one, I was like, what you look like on stage for five seconds yeah. literally lasts for five seconds. <laughs> that's it. Um, and then you're judged off of, you know, that's it. I think that's the biggest difference between CrossFit and bodybuilding um, is you're either judged, judged off of your appearance or your performance. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, it's not fun to be judged off of your appearance, especially when you put in 20 plus weeks of work and dieting and, and stuff for five seconds on stage to be judged and told that you're not good enough, you know? Yeah. And given up so many social engagements and so felt, yeah. felt awful because you're calorie cutting like that. Yeah. And yeah, like awful. and it's, it's this horrible kind of um, selection process where it, picks people out like you're saying then people who already ha are very conscious of body image and then it yeah. kind of heightens everything like and mm -hmm. I'm sure there's people who do this from a very very good point of view and I'm gonna like I too often make like broad sweeping statements but like I'm sure people <laughs> yeah. do this from a good place but I've worked with and seen so many athletes who go into bodybuilding with pretty poor body image and come out with worse body image issues yeah that was definitely me. Yeah, no, I think that if you're a whole person, whole body, mind, and soul, and you go into bodybuilding, it can, it can be really cool. And like, if you have like a really great coach that can understand reverse dieting and, and dieting correctly and stuff, like it's not necessarily inherently bad. It's not, nothing is inherently bad, right? But we can make things really bad. And I made it really like a, a, a bad demonic thing like I just allowed so many heavy chains to come from that and I put way too much of my identity in that and it was it was tough to get out of that's for sure that thought process because I was already broken going into it um, with how I felt about myself and I didn't have a lot of self-esteem and confidence and it just broke that down even more it was <laughs> it was not good it was not good at all for me personally and again feel free to skip this if you want we can always move out and we can we can edit it out but what was the moment you realized that you were going to change um from bodybuilding just yeah. getting out of it um honestly after the first one i realized i was like oh this probably is not going to be good for me because i i had like a really bad coach and yeah, I made you like the old school way of dieting. And I was taking like all these like fat burners and pills. I was like, I don't even know what I'm taking. And uh, I gained like 25 pounds really quickly, like right after the show. And I didn't even want to be in the gym for like two or three months afterward. I was super unmotivated. And 
it was just like an awful experience, but I was, I'm very hard-headed. I'm a very hard-headed person. So I was like, I'm going to do this again. Um, and so like the last experience I actually had like a really great coach. Um, but, and so he helped me a lot, get out of a lot of, um, like I had a lot of food sensitivities and I still do from it. Um, but I still was like a pretty uh, broken person spiritually. So I wish I could have, you know, done a, even better because I had a great coach by my side. Um, but I just realized after like my third or fourth show, I was just like, I just, I don't think it's worth it. It's just not worth it. And like you were saying too, of, um, you, you just have to sacrifice so much. Like there's just social, social engagements where I was just, I was grumpy all the time. Like I was just not myself. And I think I, when I found that awareness of not truly being myself every day, and I was just like angry and unhappy, I was like, all right, this is just not worth it. But it was like really hard for me to get out of because I found a lot of fulfillment through dieting and seeing my body change and stuff. And I was very hard headed about that. And it was, it was like really cool to see your body transform, but um, yeah, I had to like, just slowly pull myself away from it <laughs> because it was not healthy and I knew it wasn't, I knew it wasn't. So it was like a slow process, very slow process. From, from a mentality point of view, was there anything that was like really useful that, um, you got from bodybuilding? Yeah, I think, I think with anything that you do, whether it's good or bad, um, there's always great things to pull out of it. And so, I mean, the mental side of it was great. Um, uh, having to, you know, work out for X amount of hours a day on like a thousand calories. It's that's tough, that's <laughs> that's tough, tough for yeah. weeks on end. Right. Um, and just crazy amounts of cardio and stuff. And just realizing that, I mean, it's a it's very common saying, but like, you're stronger than what you think. Like if you really put your head down and stuff and, and do the work, like you're, you're stronger than what you think. It's hard, very hard, but um, I real I realized about about myself, and I kind of kind of already did because I loved like challenging things and like pushing myself to the limit and just just seeing how far I could really go, and that's why I like CrossFit. Um, but yeah, bodybuilding was like a whole nother. It wasn't um, necessarily pushing your um, I guess your your genetic potential uh, to the utmost extreme as far as like your cardiovascular or your strength or whatever but it definitely tested your mentality side of like how bad do you want it and how long are you willing to suffer for and it was just a suffer fest for weeks on end so um but it definitely didn't bring out the best side of me so <laughs> but yeah it definitely was a good like mental challenge so I can definitely carry that into like harder workouts and longer workouts in CrossFit of like I've done X, Y, and Z, so I can definitely do this, you know? Yeah, okay, so I thought I might be putting two and two together and getting five there, but do you reckon that's got a direct carryover into why you've got a reputation as someone who just crushes longer workouts? Yeah, I would say so. I think, like, before um, bodybuilding, or even in gymnastics, honestly, I, like, I, I look back sometimes in gymnastics, and I was like, I just really love the conditioning part of it. Mm. I love the events, don't get me wrong, but... I love the morning sessions where we had to run for 45 minutes straight and the other conditioning things for, you know, two and a half hours every morning. And I just found like a lot of fulfillment for, with that for some reason. And uh, I think it comes from my background with my dad. My dad was just really into working out and like pushing um, himself to the limits. And so like we were just very, the shad burns are very extreme people, whether it's uh, in working out or whatever we decide to do. And, um, I definitely carried that into, I did long distance running, um, a couple of years after my back injury, initial one, uh, because of, that was the only thing that didn't hurt my back, which did not make sense. Uh, I couldn't swim, couldn't do anything else, but long distance running did not hurt my back. So got into like half marathons and, and 10 Ks and five Ks and whatever. And, um, that is the, you have to be real crazy in the head for that stuff sometimes like you have to get into some deep dark places with running because it it hurt it hurts it's hard mm -hmm. it's really hard so um I definitely account to a lot of different things my dad how I grew up 
a uh, little bit of gymnastics and long distance running. That'll do it for you. Are there any memories of your dad that explain like who he <laughs> oh, yes. and, and how he, yeah, go yeah. on? Uh, anytime we would go on road trips or honestly, any, any type of trip, even in the airport. But um, I remember like there, there was four of us kids. So I'm the baby of four. And so we were wild children. Um, my mom had us back to back in ages. So it was four under the age of five. Um, so it was a lot. It was a lot. And we were a lot. We were very hyper. And so anytime we would go on road trips uh, and we would stop at a gas station, my dad's like, all right, everybody out of the car. We're taking a lap around the gas station and then you got push-ups, sit-ups, doing it again. Love so it. we just like make laps of that. Or um, there was one night where he was like, all right, everyone's feet underneath the couch. And we're like, all right. He's like a thousand sit-ups before we go to bed. And we all did it. Like we all did it. We're all like, we're all hard-headed, that hard-headed that we did it. We did it. Um, so it was just like always things like that, where it's just like always like workout challenges and, um, you know, like hiking up a mountain in Colorado. And I think me and my brother were like 11 and nine and we made like one of the better times, I guess, like we like sprinted up the mountain and then made it back before noon. And everyone was like, that was a 14,000 elevation mountain. How did you do that? <laughs> We're like, we just sprinted down, you know? Like, it's just silly things that we used to do. So, yeah, I just kind of grew up yeah. with very extremeness. <laughs> yeah, that's I mean, fortunately like, and unfortunately. I mean, it's it's both. <laughs> no, you know, like, it's it's something that talking to athletes, we, we hear kind of not the same stories. And I think your dad's definitely um, an exception in, in that. He sounds like, <laughs> I think, brilliant. Um, but yeah, you yeah. hear similar kind of things of like, it's a cultural norm for you it's a, or it's a familial norm for you yeah. to kind of push that yeah. hard and, and to do different yeah. things. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, and it doesn't mean though, too, like, you know, as I've gotten older, like you, you know, personally, like how much it hurts. So sometimes it does get hard. Like I've definitely kind of experienced that in the last like year or two where like it, it gets hard sometimes, you know, like pushing yourself to those maximal limits because like I've done it for so long, my, I would say my entire life, you know, I've done it since I was five. And so being 28 now, almost 29, I'm just like, it, it hurts. And so, and especially in CrossFit too, like, well, if you take off like, even a couple of days, let alone like a month, and you try to come back to it, it hurts. Mm -hmm. It hurts really bad. It hurts really bad. And especially when you know, like, how, like, quote, unquote, good you were the year before how where you were at physically. And it's like, you want to either get to that point again, or even better, like, you just know how much you have to make it hurt in training. And it's hard. It, def it definitely does get hard. Definitely gets hard. What keeps you going in those times? Um, it's it's funny because I think I used uh, a bad bad fuel for a very long time. Of uh, it's really bad to say this, but it's when I started in 2017. Um, it was it was a really bad time in my life. I was 23. I was actually going through a divorce, and I used to party a lot. I used to drink a lot, and so that was kind of like my it was like a reward system of like going really hard or doing an event or a competition. I was like, yeah, I get to drink afterward, you know? And as I've gotten older, that's not something that fulfills me anymore. I don't want to do that. It hurts. And um, I've actually been kind of going through a process of like trying to figure out like more good fuel sources, if that makes sense. And uh, it's interesting. I didn't realize like how how much I use those bad fuel sources. And I think bad fuel sources can get you pretty far. Like got me eighth place. Like that's pretty great, you know? Um, but I think that there's a lot more in me that I haven't been able to show to people. And I think the only way I'll be able to do that is to change those fuel sources of going from bad to, to good. <laughs> and I know that's very like vague to say, um, but I think right now I'm, I'm actually kind of in the process of kind of figuring those out a little bit more, Sweet. but, um, but, but I think there is that deep love for, um, for pain, um, and for wanting to get into those dark places and just seeing how far your body can really go and how far it can really push. And I feel like some people are gifted kind of with that mindset and others are like, 
I'm good. Uh, I don't want to, I'm good. I don't want to do that, you know? Um, and so I think it's kind of going back to that, that love for that. Um, I think that's where kind of like the fuel source really lies is you, you have to do it for yourself, but like you can't do it for anybody else. Right. Mm. And, and deep down, I, I think I, I love being in the gym. I, I love being in the gym and I hope I can stay in the gym the rest of my life. And I want to be healthy enough um, after my CrossFit career to where I can do that. Um, Cause I do have a huge passion for it. Um, and so, and a huge passion is just like get into the dark places. They hurt, but they're fun. They're fun when you get to the other side of it. <laughs> yeah. It's, a cool oh, no, that's, it's so good to hear that. Like you can either come from a place of fear or you can come from a place of love. Like you can fear and try and yeah. get away from the pain that you're not really confronting and you're avoiding. Like we all do it in certain ways, or you can go yeah. towards this, um, this place of love and curiosity it's like oh yeah. what am i going to feel like what is this going to feel like and how am i going to react and will i be able to keep control and like it's that yeah. curiosity and that kind of distance from your own thoughts and emotions and kind of observation of it that is mm-hmm. allows you to go that bit further there's this um there's a study that i always talk about in this podcast so like listeners will be bored by it but I'll, I'll go over it quickly there's there's um there's a maze or a, like a speed trap for a rat essentially and it goes from one end of the, the uh, track to the other they time how quickly you can do it if there's cheese or a treat at the end it does it pretty quickly but when there's a smell mm-hmm. of uh, um, a smell of a cat at the other side and the cheese or the treat it does it way more quickly because there's that combination of fear and like mm. and love and i think it's useful to have that hey i don't want to become this type of person i know i want to get away from this because that gives you enough kind of fire when when it gets tough like when it gets really tough yeah. and you don't want to do it you can like hey actually behind me is a really ugly image that i don't want to get to and it's an ugly version <laughs> of myself that i'm yeah. just like i'm not into but in front of me there's this kind of there's the love version there's the excitement there's the joy there's the curiosity um and it's finding that it sounds like you've been doing some good work around that yeah yeah i think it goes back to like having a true passion for it too i think passion can take you a lot farther than um really anything else and so passion is going to get you through those those hard days where you don't sometimes they don't want to do it. Sometimes Mm -hmm. you're tired. Sometimes you're exhausted and just remembering your, like your love for it can carry you a long way. So, yeah. You've mentioned previously um, about a journaling practice. Like everyone Mm -hmm. has different journaling practices. Um, Like we have a methodology and a system for it and other people have different methodologies and systems, but like, what does, what does your journaling practice look like? Um, it's, it's kind of transformed over the years. Um, but like it, it used to be where I would do like a huge grateful uh, portion where it's like either write down, you know, three to five things that I'm really grateful for. And I still do that. Um, but sometimes they get very long winded. So it's like pages upon pages. Um, but, but like sometimes too, like when I initially started it, it was just like air, yeah, water, food, you know, cause like, when you start doing that, you're just like, oh, you know what I am grateful for or thankful for. And it's like, there's always things to be thankful and grateful for. Um, but I think as my practice has transformed, um, there has been some things that have stayed the same and things that have transformed, but uh, I'm really big into like a devotion. And so I always pick a devotion. It could be like a 30 day devotion, 60 or hundred days. I'm doing one that's hundred days right now. Um, and it always has like a Bible verse and I dive a little bit deeper into the Bible and I have like footnotes on it. Cause the Bible can be very confusing and the stories in there are like, it, I, they kind of go over my head sometimes. So it's good to have like footnotes of like what you're really reading and understanding it. Um, and sometimes you get more from like, like it gives you a Bible verse, but sometimes that Bible verse doesn't really speak to you. So sometimes in the full chapter, you get something more out of it, if that makes sense than just the Bible verse alone. Um, and so I'll write down like bullet points on that and just try to make it more, make it make sense in my mind. And I'm a very like tact, uh, tactical, not, not tactical, um, tactile, yes, learner. And so I have to like do and write Mm -hmm. and, um, I definitely learn better that way. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of like bullet points and then going through the devotion and then either before or after I'll kind of reflect on just kind of how I'm feeling either like usually it's trying to 
be as, as grateful as possible for the things that I do have. Cause like I said, there's always things to be grateful for. Um, even when you're going through a bit of a storm or something hard, um, but, and just being thankful for little things so important for that. I think that's where you kind of like, for me personally, that's where I, I see God is in little things and like even little things like this is something like probably doesn't really matter to anybody else, but I've always been like, I've always had a really hard time sleeping really hard time sleeping and I've been like that since I was little like just nightmares and I just got to the point where I'm like I always have to take sleep aids whether it's like melatonin or CBD or whatever else I can find to help me sleep and just turn off my mind and uh actually this year right after Wadapalooza I've gotten to the point where I don't have to like use anything for some reason so it's just like those little things where it's just like it's literally a miracle because I never thought that I would be in this place where I wouldn't have to take something to go to bed. So it's just like those little things to be grateful for because there's always those things uh, amongst a, a back spasm or whatever else is going on in your life, you know? Um, but yeah, so it could be very long winded. It could be like eight, nine pages long where I'm just kind of writing out my feelings of things I'm thankful for and things that I'm going through and hardships and just kind of reflecting on things. Um, and then it could be super short. It could be like just a page or two where you know, um, doing more towards the devotion and kind of deep thoughts on that and stuff and bullet points. So sounds like you're doing three things really. Like when I'm listening to that as a mindset coach, I'm hearing kind of three separate activities in there. There's one, which is like, Uh like you're streaming your subconscious out and kind of like whatever's going on and kind of just like kind of getting your thinking in, sorry, thinking in ink, like you're getting it out, you're seeing it. There's something outside where it's all nebulous and swirling around your head. Mm -hmm. And like, that's super useful to do because it's like, Hey, that's my mindset. on I can see it and I can see what's going on then you are yeah. aligning yourself to something higher. So it's like a better version of you. We call this direction review. And like we put together um, like your, the character traits that you're aiming at and the ways you can do mm-hmm. that. And, but you're doing a similar mm-hmm. version. And then there's the uh, gratitude as well. It's like this one I'm grateful for. And like, eventually it's interesting. You said you, you did that loads to begin with, but it seems like you've kind mm-hmm. of wired that network you've built it up and yeah. like it's it becomes a default setting just like moving a barbell well exactly yeah I was about to say it was, it was well it's not that it's like forced at the beginning but you kind of mm-hmm. have to like you have it's to introduce work. it somehow and you have to like force it a little bit to become an autopilot thing and now it's like just more autopilot so I don't feel like it has to be so structured I guess of like yeah. I would literally write out one this is what I'm thinking for two this is what I'm thinking for so and it you know, there, there might be days though, where I'm just like brains not working very well, foggy, like you're going to have those days. So that's where you can kind of go back to that auto or that default setting, you know, but most of the days now I can just kind of like let it flow. And like, I can hit all the, like you said, all the points that I would like to hit and then in a day in a journal and stuff. So yeah, I think it's, it's been the best thing I've ever done. Really. It's really has been, um, I can't think of, I mean, like, it's maybe been like one or two days that I've missed in the last three years doing this or since 2019. And I can, I can tell the difference. Like I can just really tell the difference if I have a day where I don't do it, but it, it's, it's so like embedded into my schedule that it's like the first thing that I do in the morning. Like I, it's, I just go straight to it. I come and sit right here in the spot and get out my devotion, my journal, my Bible. And I just sit here and reflect. So super important. I'm, yeah, I'm stoked for you. Like that's so good to hear. And it's <laughs> like you. it makes such a difference in your life, right? It's um yeah. you've training you're training your mental fitness. Yeah. And I think too, like these are the things that I can carry over when my career's done. Yeah. And that's kind of where I want to set myself up for success. Like this isn't just something I do right now because I'm competing. Like, no. If anything, this this all this stuff continues on mm-hmm. the rest of my life. And so I think that's the most important thing for me to like, I think I had to realize that. Um, and, um, yeah, just make it a part of my, my daily habitual routine. Sweet. That's awesome. Really, really cool. Um, one thing I definitely want to touch on, and I know we're kind of running up on time, so I don't want to keep you too long is, um, is, you spoke about junk volume in that um, interview with Morning Chalk. I found that so interesting because again, you're speaking about things that 
I hear the whole time from athletes of all levels. Like I've got to do more. I've got to do more. Like if I don't do Mm -hmm. more, I'm not good enough. Like I'm never going to get there. Like, and then the body image thing tying into that as well. um, Mm -hmm. You give such a, an interesting perspective on that. So could you touch (laughs) on that quickly, please? Thank you. Yeah. Um, Yeah. I think, I think for me, I just, I just realized that I think there, there is a time and a place to do um volume and work like you have to put in the numbers um to get to the point where your body just kind of like I feel like now in my career um I don't need to do as much and I can kind of bounce back to my base if that makes sense so my base kind of grows every year you know either even if it's just little by little um but yeah I think too much of a good thing can be bad kind of like what I said at the beginning and I was just kind of realizing that I was trying to like just connect some dots before Wadapalooza. Um, because right after I got, you know, obviously I got COVID uh, for the CrossFit Games, so I didn't compete. And when I came back after a month of being off, um, I had ser- a series of injuries. It was really crazy. I, I um, had a bunch of nerve pain in my fingers, my hands, and uh, numbness. And so that took me out for a while. And then I had a high ankle sprain all the way up into my knee. And was out for a while with that. And then my back went out on me. And I was just like, all right, off season is done. <laughs> mm-hmm. And I uh, I just told my coach, I was like, I'm going to I'm gonna go. Uh, I'm going to go see my fiance. I'm going to go to LA for about two weeks. And I can't do anything here anyways. So I'm just going to go reset. And the, the old Bethany would have been like, all right, I'm not going to do anything. I'm just going to sit here and be my pity party and be sad. And I was like, no, it's like literally a choice. Like I physically can't work out. Right. But like I can mentally work out. And so, um, I dove deep, real deep into a lot of things and just had a lot of epiphanies when I came back from my trip and just realized that it it goes back to like the control and the fear problems. Um, and realizing that I have a huge passion for the gym, like I said, and I love, I love working out but I was allowing fear and control to control my destiny in the gym, if that makes sense. So, um, and I just realized, okay, like I'm getting hurt every year for a major competition or even during my off season, like I keep getting hurt. And so like, I can't, can't get better if I keep getting hurt, you know, I'm always going to just stay at my base and that's it. Um, so how, how do I make changes to this? What's, what's going to be, what's going to be that change. And I just realized that I was allowing fear and control to make my decisions of either why I was doing something or not in the gym. And, um, a lot, a big one for me, was like the fear of being fat. I was just like, well, I don't want to get fat. And that just goes back to the 12 year old Bethany. And so I would do extra work for that. And then another one was, um, I'm never going to be good enough. And I think we're told as athletes when we're little that if you're not working hard enough, someone else is working harder than you somewhere else. And it's like, there is some truth to that. I get it. I get what they were trying to say. But when you tell a little girl that or a little boy that, they're going to take that to the utmost extreme, especially an athlete where we're already hard headed. And so I definitely carried that into my 20s. And uh, it's kind of led me to where I'm at right now. And, uh, and then the, like, the fear of letting others down. So like, if I can't do something in the programming that my coach is asking me to do, I'm a failure and I'm letting him down. And I just had to get to the realize like, no, I'm actually doing him a disservice and myself a disservice if I do something and my body is literally telling me no. And it's not a no of because you're lazy. It's a no because something actually hurts. <laughs> Uh, and, um, and it's, and it's hard to know that sometimes if you're not in tuned with your body, um, and it's hard to trust yourself with that too. When you've been thinking, I've been thinking this way for 20 years, you know, so it's a process and I'm still processing it every single day and it's a battle every single day. But I think having that awareness of like, kind of going through a pause for a second of like, okay, is it, is it any of those things? Am I wanting to do this extra work because it's actually going to benefit me? Or am I wanting to do this extra work because I think I'm going to be fat if I don't do it? I think I'm letting myself down or others down or that I'm not going to be good enough. And if those are the reasons why I'm doing extra work, 
all right, that's not the reason to do it. You know, it's hard though. It's, it's really hard yeah, it, when you have it, that. It, that it absolutely that is. It abs- yeah, one hundred percent is, and like the mental shortcut that kids often make in this scenario, when you're kind of presented with, oh, there's out, there's someone out there working hard on you, essentially, is that, yeah. oh, if I don't do that, I'm not deserving of love, and like that kind of yeah. gets shortcutted, and that becomes the default setting, and like it gets so deeply bedded down into who we believe we are that it's hard work bringing out, and you've obviously like pulled out those beliefs you're like okay you're talking about um the like fear and the fear of being fat essentially and the um like and the fear of letting your coach down and stuff like those are the beliefs the stories the narratives around it you've noticed how they showed up as physical sensations for example your back as as you mentioned how did that show up as thoughts and emotions um i could tell that I just get more stressed out and I become not the version of myself that I want to be. And I actually have a, another weird indicator. Um, so I love, I love picking up trash. I'm like a weirdo that likes picking up trash and just, it comes from my grandma, and my grandma. We're just yeah. extreme. We're just weird. Yeah, um, yep. So I oh, really, um, so my grandma growing up, she, we would, anytime we would go on a hike or a walk, she would always bring like a plastic bag with her and we just pick up trash. And so she's, she's gone. Uh, she died a couple of years ago. And so, um, Ever since then, I just was like hyper aware that I think I was always doing it, but I became more hyper aware of like, I felt closer to her when I picked mm. up trash. And, and then I kind of connected the dots of like, I think those are just like little assignments that God has for me for the day of like, I want you to pick up that trash. So when I walk past a piece of trash uh, and I don't want to pick it up, I realize that I'm not in sync with what I need to be doing. I'm mm. overly stressed. I'm putting too much on my plate um, and just like allowing, I think it goes back to the fear and control thing to control me. And I'm just rushing from one thing to the next. And I don't think that we're, we're, we're not meant to rush from one thing to the next. And I think we're supposed to be slower, slower human beings um, and be more present. Yes. And so like, that's a huge indicator for me for, and it's, like I said, it's different for everyone. That's just, I found that to be one indicator for me. I, there's multiple ones, but that's a big one for me. If, if, if I don't feel like I want to pick up that piece of trash, then more than likely there's a lot of chaos going on around me. Yeah, that yeah that's, weird. that's so sweet no 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 it's, it's not at all like and but, like yeah. it, it's a awesome that comes from your, your grandmother like i love the, i love things yeah. like that um because yeah. it's like a reminder of like oh yeah she's really important i think that's sweet um and b yeah. it's like it's cool yeah. that you've figured out that when you are too busy to pick up trash then like yeah. your your mindset is non-optimal um and that's a yeah. really useful trigger like or we... i'm really frustrated about it too because i like i'll get mad if I'm like, I've got a lot going on, I'll get mad that there's trash on the ground and there's people like this in the world that are throwing trash on the ground. And it's like, it's not about that. It's literally not about that. It's not about like being entitled that you're a better person for not throwing trash on the ground. It's not about that. So mm-hmm. I know when I start getting entitled about it too, I'm like, all right, I need to reset. <laughs> nice. One of the good reminders, that I, I think it's, it's so cool. And your dog's called Bella, right? Yeah. Yeah. Like I think dogs are the best right here. Yes. Best hound. Loving it. Um, (laughs) The um, I think dogs are a great reminder because like you said, like she's asleep right now. Like we are put into this kind of world of like produce, 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 like an automaton Mm -hmm. of like get up whatever time, be productive entirely until we go to sleep and then switch off. Like taking time yeah. to deload, especially as an athlete, is quite a difficult thing when CrossFit is often described as like all these plates spinning. And it's like, okay, yeah. I've, and it's not just the physical movements. It's like, I should be recovering better. I should be nailing my nutrition and I should be deloading properly. Like, how long, how do you actually take time to deload to de stress? Um, I think taking time for myself in the morning uh, is a really important thing. And I, I think also though, it, it's okay if that time in the morning is at a different time. And I think I was, a, I'm a very structured person. So I'm like, it has to be in the morning at this time and blah, 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 blah. Um, and realizing that sometimes my mornings are a little crazy and that it's okay to do it in the afternoon. And, and that's why I kind of say it for other people too, because some people are like, well, I don't have time in the morning to do that. 
it's like, yeah, but you can find 30 minutes somewhere in your schedule. Right. Um, and so I think that's like a really important thing to like ground me is to have that time, um, just to kind of like sit, pause, be quiet, uh, listen, and, um, just not worry about all the other chaos that goes on around me. Cause a lot of people need something from me. A lot of people, um, like it's just, there's always like something that needs to be done. There's always things that are pending. And I think just separating yourself from that, even for just a brief moment, um, kind of just sets you up for more success. It's just like, kind of goes back to the, the pausing. You need to pause and like, think about things too. Um, think about how, like the way that you react and respond to things will affect your future, either in a positive or a negative way. Um, or in like my instance, I have a fiance. So like the things that I do, how is it going to affect our marriage? You know, just like little things like that, where, uh, me and my friend call it practicing the pause. So like you literally have to, it's a practice. It's a muscle that you have to kind of develop and learn. And it's just for us, it's practicing the pause is like inviting God into that moment of like, okay, God, like what, what do you want me to do in this moment? But it's also just pausing for a moment and just how the way I react and respond or say yes or no to something, how is that going to affect my career, my future, my relationship, all that stuff. Practicing the pause. That's beautiful. I, I really like that. Yeah. And it, it fits in whether it's like kind of modern psychology of the analyzing the space between stimulus response and it fits in mm -hmm. Western culture and religion and it fits in Eastern culture, religion, like observing the silence and the space, like it works so well. Mm -hmm. Like that is, that is sweet. Yeah. I like that a lot. Are there any other aspects yeah. to your mindset practice? Um, I think like the biggest thing, like I said, is, uh, at the beginning is community. Um, just having that close niche of people that you can really be vulnerable with, um, has been huge, huge for me, especially in the last, uh, honestly, in the last couple of months, I've really invited people in more than usual. And it's like a really scary thing because I think in the past I've, I put a lot of trust and faith in to the wrong people. And I always get either let down or hurt by it. And so I think that's why I cut off myself from a lot of people for a really long time but um when you when you find those people that you can really trust and be vulnerable with like that is just like a huge part of just like mindset and um being like the best version of yourself that you can be so yeah other than like journaling taking time to myself saying no to things a little bit more um, you don't have to say yes to everything because I think when we say yes to everything, it's a people pleasing thing. Um, and it's not necessarily what's best for us. And so also like, that's where you can pause for a second and be like, am I saying yes to this? Cause I actually want to do it. Or am, or am I just saying yes, because I just want to please others. And that'll always leave you miserable. That's for sure. It'll always leave you miserable if you always just say yes to everything to people please. So that's a, it's a hard one for me. It's a really hard one for me, but yeah. I've gotten better at that. <laughs> like I personally learned people pleasing. Oh, it, it, I've never had this bit before where I might have to cut something out that I say. Um, I, I personally learned this people pleasing strategy as a, a way to keep adults happy when I was a kid or to stop them yeah. being like overly, um, emotional. Um, and I thought mm -hmm. that was like, I, I learned that it's a pretty clever thing you do as a kid to go, okay, I'm going to develop this thing and I'm going to do whatever I think they want. And I'm going to intuit what they want in order to yeah. keep the, the situation stable. And then that becomes yeah. something that you, yeah, it becomes something you practice. Right. And it becomes something you get yeah. good at. Yeah. And I think the biggest thing is like realizing that no matter, no matter what choices that you make, like you're never going to appease everyone and make everyone happy. So why don't you just start with, and, and, and I don't say this in a selfish way, but why don't you just start with yourself? Mm. You know, I think that's, it's an, it's important part to like, just not do things for other people for their approval, you know, because if you're just doing that, that's not good. That's not good at all. So, um, and I've, oh, I, I think as athletes, athletes do that. Um, I definitely did that just through, like we kind of talked about at the beginning, like gymnastics and just wanting the approval of my coach. Um, 
And I think people with daddy issues, like we just want to get their approval of our, you know, male figures or, you know, boys with mom issues. We just want to get their approval of women, you know, it goes both ways. Um, and just realizing that there's no like fulfillment in that and uh, satisfaction in that. So it's like kind of getting to the bottom of things and realizing why you're doing things and saying yes to things or no to things. So you're watching yourself on a kind of, um, on a pretty consistent basis thinking, Hey, am I, am I doing this for myself? Am I doing it for someone else? Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's where community comes into of like, you can ask them to like, Hey, am I not necessarily, should I say yes or no to this thing, but just asking their opinion on things and, and helping them kind of work through like, okay, am I really doing this for, for myself or am I doing it for, for other people? You know? So I think it just keeps the accountability going too when you have the trusted people in your circle. Yeah. You know, what's, what's hard about that though is figuring out what you actually want, like sifting through all yeah. the things that you think you want um, and thinking, yeah. oh, are these what I truly want or are these what I've been taught to want or I've picked up to the, yeah. it's a good thing to desire. And that's like, that's hard in itself because quite often you have to say, actually this thing that I'm doing, this thing that I've dedicated my whole life to, and I have all these connections within as well, these friendships, these kind of relationships, like, that's built on something I don't actually want. So you have to, it's a, it's a, it's a rabbit hole that you dive down and not knowing how deep it yeah. is. Yeah. And I think it, the biggest indicator of that too, is like, are you always stressed out? <laughs> are you unhappy with yourself? And are you always stressed out? And um, I feel like those are two easy and big indicators of like, you're probably not doing what you're supposed mm -hmm. to be doing. Yeah. Beautiful. I think that's a great place to, to wrap up I, there's a couple of questions i always finish up with one of them is like what habits do you perform for your own mental health performance you i think we've covered that um the other <laughs> yeah. one is like what bo what books have you gifted most to other people oh um so actually this is so funny i just have i have it right here so my fiance gave this to me a couple years ago and this is from ryan holiday and oh, this nice. book the series trilogy. is great yes yeah so Ego is the enemy, the uh, obstacle is the way, and um, what's the other one? Silence is Stillness the key. is key. Oh, stillness, yeah. yeah, stillness, yeah. Beautiful. Yeah, so this is, a, this is a great one, and I'm actually about to gift it to somebody, so um, it's funny. But yeah, those are great ones. I actually just got one from Allison. Uh, she oh, gave nice. me one, or well, didn't actually. She uh, gave it to me during semifinals last year. It's called the Ultra Realist. Maybe nice. that, did you just recommend there. that? Yeah yeah yeah, yeah that's um, a great that was a great one that was a great one and then she just recommended another one to me um i can't did remember the name of it right now quotient, by any chance no did she did give me that one though too and i read that one that was a great one um it was something about growth i don't know yeah i can't think of the name right now but anywho those are great ones but uh i think this is like when my fiance gave this one to me like two years ago i was like oh, mm. yeah these are great these are great and they're not religious based um but there is like some religious things in it but it's more about like the stoicism and stuff and yeah they're they're really good and then this guy ryan holiday is actually based out of uh, austin texas where i was born and raised so that's kind of like it's like uh, nice. a cool thing it's really cool yeah but, he owns um, a really like cool the... bookstore there as well like this like he's just started up this like really small independent bookstore that they stock i think it's basically all philosophy books um and he hangs out oh, really? quite a lot so i think it's a good place to, cool. to go if you're ever back in austin yeah yeah that's awesome so to know but yeah there's some yeah there's some good ones like as far as uh like atomic habit that one's a good one too um but yeah i would say this is my my favorite as far as getting gifting Nice. If you like that, you'll also like a book called The Stoic Challenge by William Irvin. Um, and mm. it's it's essentially when something doesn't go your way, look at it as a challenge and an opportunity. Um, and it's very much mm. like The Obstacle is the Way, but a kind of different take mm -hmm. on it. We had one on the podcast, so shameless plug for our own podcast. I'll, I'll send you the, um, okay. the episode afterwards because he's, he, yeah, he really yeah. crushed it. He's got the best voice ever as well, which is always nice to listen to. <laughs> um, that's great. Um, so books, yeah, Ryan Holiday's work is fantastic. And then finally, where can people yeah. find you? Where can people follow you on Instagram? That kind of thing. Um, so Grinstead, 
Instagram handle is Bethany CF and that's kind of basically where I'm at right now. Um, I don't really have, I mean, I have Facebook, but I don't really, no one gets on that. Um, and then uh, Twitter, I just, there's just too many things. There's too many things out there and I'm just like, I can't, this is too overwhelming. So Instagram it is. Um, yeah. Perfect. Cool. Thank you so much for your time. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Um, thank you for having me on here. Really appreciate it.